seated. As you're taking your Bibles and turning to the text for this morning, which is in Exodus chapter 3 and also in Psalm 23, where we've been looking at the name of God, the Lord, our shepherd, in this series on the names of God, let me just mention something. Some of you were a little bit later than these were passed out. This past week, we installed an assistive listening system for those who are having difficulty uh, hearing me in this building, which has a great deal of echo in it. And so, if you have not been able to hear it because either it's not loud enough or because there seems to be an echo, we have purchased a wireless hearing system. They're found in these little blue bags. John Filker was walking around offering those to folks a little bit earlier today. It works very well. We tested it out. Each one of these bags contains two things. It contains a receiver and it contains a headset. They're all preset to the correct channel that we're broadcasting on. There's one button on top. So if it's not loud enough for you, all you have to do is rotate that button. It will click to start it and you can make it until everybody in the auditorium can hear it coming out of your earphones. (laughs) They can get very, very loud. So if you have a real difficult time hearing, you can make it as loud as you want or as soft as you want. And actually with the earphones on, you can turn it off and not hear me at all. So uh, for some, that might be a blessing. But when you're done with those, please put them carefully back into the bag. Please do not wind up the cords because they're very fragile cords. And each one of those receivers costs about $100, so please don't break them. And then zip them back up and turn them back into John, who will mark off your name on the list that it's been turned in. Each one of these are numbered with letters, and uh, we encourage you, if you have any difficulty, please check one of these out with John and use it for the service. Now, is there anyone else here today who would like to have one of these things to listen in? Everyone has it? Okay, that sounds good. All right, we continue our studies now with the names of God. And we've been looking at the compound name, the Lord, our shepherd. There are seven different compound names of God in the scripture. Each one of them describes for us his character and the way in which he takes care of us who are his people. This is one of the most beautiful of those compound names. And we've seen many things, in fact, 17 different things are told to us in this psalm, in Psalm 23, about this particular name of God, who he is, what he does, why we can trust him, what we can expect from him, and how he will care for us who are his sheep. Last week we saw the contrast between God who is the good shepherd and the bad shepherds of Israel. We saw that there are at least ten definitive markers about bad shepherds that Jesus himself gave to us in John chapter 10. They don't enter in by the door, that is, they give false ways of salvation. They climb up some other way, they teach other ways of salvation and sanctification. They are thieves and robbers. Those people are going to steal from you, so watch out for their covetousness, religious leaders who fall into this category. They're called strangers. Watch out for the strangers because they have a different voice than the shepherd. His voice is the word of God. Listen to what they say and test it by scripture. The shepherds that came before Jesus, Jesus said, are thieves and robbers, false messiahs. Many had come prior to the coming of Christ claiming to be the Messiah. There are many who have come since then who also claim to be the Messiah. The thief cometh, he says, not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. That tells you their program and it tells you the results of those who are bad shepherds. Stealing, killing, and destroying. They are hirelings. They're only taking that job of religious leadership because it gives them an easy income. They don't have a personal investment in the flock whose whose own the sheep are not, Jesus says. He sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, and the sheep are scattered. That is, they are only looking out for themselves and not for the flock. And they care not for the sheep. 
Isaiah called them greedy and covetous. David reminds us not to worry about them because we can wait patiently on the Lord, but there are going to be false shepherds out there. Ezekiel tells us that we are to watch out for those who are covetous, greedy, seeking leadership so that they can make money. He says, woe to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the sheep? Both Jude and Second Peter remind us of those same warnings about bad shepherds. They creep in unawares. They are ungodly. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. They deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Doctrine and practice. Examine the lives of those who are teaching you or preaching to you or the authors that you are reading or the people that you listen to on the radio or the television or those who are in positions of leadership, perhaps prominent worldwide, perhaps local. Ask yourself, do they fit the character qualities of a good shepherd? That is, they reflect Jesus Christ who said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Or do they fit the category of the bad shepherds that are so graphically described in scripture and against whom we are so warned? It says they are covetous. They make merchandise of you. They are false prophets. They are false teachers. They deny the Lord that bought them. I'm listening to the different things that Jude and Peter say about them. They are sporting themselves with their own deceivings. They have eyes full of adultery. They cannot cease from sin. They beguile unstable souls. They exercise covetous practices. Do you get the picture? Those are what bad shepherds are like. When you find somebody who fits into that category, be very, very careful of what they're teaching you because they may be teaching you something that is designed to take advantage of you instead of feeding you who are the flock of God. God says this because he calls the sheep my flock. Oh, we find it everywhere in scripture. Ezekiel even mentions it. Zechariah mentions it. Jesus spoke of the bad shepherds and he places them with the goats who will be judged at the end of the tribulation when he separates the sheep from the goats. But he views the people to whom he ministered as his own sheep. He viewed them as sheep having no shepherd. And then we move to verse 6 last week. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. When we follow the shepherd, goodness and mercy follow us. They follow in our path. We normally think of that in a very selfish manner where we think, oh, goodness and mercy, if I follow the shepherd, then I'm going to be blessed. We've fallen prey, I think, too often to the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel where you know, do right and lots of good things will happen to you. But if you read the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, you will find many who walked by faith, and they are listed in the last half of the chapter, but others. And they are stoned, they are sawn asunder, they are tormented, they are persecuted, they wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and in dens of the earth. Do not think that just because you follow the shepherd that you will escape all trouble in life. That's not what he promised. The Bible tells us all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. When you take a stand for Jesus Christ, when you make it clear and evident that you belong to him, when others around you perceive you they will have a savor of you, either a savor of life unto life or a savor of death unto death. Something is going to follow you as you go through life, as you spread the good news of Christ. Your life will be known for two things, goodness and mercy. Those are the scent that you leave behind wherever you go. A scent like we have a body scent that a bloodhound can follow. The scent that a believer leaves behind is goodness and mercy. That's the trail that follows him. And you and I, if we truly know the Lord Jesus Christ, will have lives that have been transformed 
into the image of Christ so that we reflect him. As we follow the shepherd, so we see goodness and mercy following behind us and impacting the lives of all those who are around us and those who have some desperate needs. And we are sent to minister to them. The scent that uniquely identifies us. Be ye therefore followers of God. Remember, Jesus is God. He's the good shepherd that we follow. This is Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Be followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. That's the aroma that we receive from Christ. That is the aroma that we are supposed to be leaving behind us. Even as it follows the Lord Jesus Christ everywhere he went, the Gospels tell us Jesus went about doing good. What are we doing? If we are following the Good Shepherd, what should we be doing? What should be following in our path? Goodness and mercy. It's interesting as we contrast and compare the doctrines of grace and the doctrines of mercy. Grace is what God extends to us while we are sinners. We don't deserve it. We are only worthy of condemnation and ultimately of hell. But grace is extended to us as we are guilty. Where Christ pays for our sins on Calvary's cross and through faith in him, we have God's grace which brings us into fellowship with him and forgives our sins. But we live in a world that is full of pain, a world that is full of misery, a world that is full of bitterness and hatred and disease and death and suffering. And that's where mercy comes in. Grace to the guilty, mercy to the miserable. Just think two M's. Mercy to the miserable. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Is that what is coming out of your life? Is that the aroma that you leave behind you? The practical results, the impact of your life as you follow the shepherd. So what does this all mean? The good shepherd never misses a beat. He never fails to provide. We've seen in the few verses at the beginning. He never fails to feed us. He never fails to refresh us. He never fails to keep us in his care. He never fails to discipline us. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Remember, we talked about those, those sticks that the, the shepherd carries, not only to protect us from the wild animals, but they're used for discipline of ornery sheep. He never fails us as long as we live. There are no mistakes in his plan, no lapses in his memory, no shortfall in his provision, no maliciousness in his dealings with us. And that changes the way we are supposed to live. Our cup runs over to the blessing of others as we follow the shepherd. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And lastly, he guarantees that final shelter of the fold, the last phrase of Psalm 23, which is where we begin today. The final shelter of the fold, his own house. That last phrase says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Remember Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. 
If you're trying to get to the Father by any other way than Jesus, it won't work. If you're trying to get to heaven by any other way than by Jesus, it won't work. If you're trying to get to heaven by Jesus plus something else, it won't work. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man, and that includes every one of us, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is enough, he is sufficient, it is an insult to God to try to add something to Jesus. When we come and say to God, well, look at me, I've trusted Jesus, but I've also been baptized. I've also joined the church. I've also given money. I've also given alms to the poor. I've been kind to the cat and not kicked the dog and all the other silly things that we tell God. We're insulting him. We're telling him what you did on the cross is not enough. If it's not enough on the cross, then Jesus is not the only way to heaven. This is a bottom line issue for every one of us. This is the point to which we must come and say, I am going to trust Jesus alone. And when I do, I get a marvelous peace that passes all understanding. But as long as you're trying to come to heaven by Jesus plus something else, you will feel very, very insecure. You'll always wonder, am I really going to make it? Have I done enough of my own good works? Have I canceled out enough of my sin to be good enough to get to heaven? Dear friend, you don't have to cancel your sin. That's what Jesus did at Calvary. Oh, trust him. He's here to give you life. That's what he promised. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That's Jesus speaking. What have you added to the cross? Whatever it is you have added to the cross is the thing that is standing between you and salvation. It is the thing that is standing between you and heaven. It is the thing that is standing between you and a right relationship with the living God. Trust Christ. He died for you. He bore your sins in his body on Calvary's cross. And at the end he said, It is finished! There's nothing you can add to that. When something is finished, it is finished! What a marvelous Savior we have. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that is Jesus' promise. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Have you trusted him? It's the only way when you pass from this life to be where he has prepared a place for you. That brings us to the sixth name that scripture gives us for God. The sixth compound name where we have the name Jehovah attached to a descriptive adjective. And this comes to us from Jeremiah 23.6. The name is Yahweh Sidkenu, or Jehovah the Lord, our righteousness. Jeremiah 23.6. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is the name whereby he shall be called. The Lord, our righteousness. 
in the day that Judah and Israel are dwelling safely. It hasn't been that way for a very long time. But there is coming a day when Israel and Judah will dwell safely and God will go by this name, the Lord our righteousness. It's interesting to see this name in its context in Jeremiah 23 because you see we've just been talking about the Lord our shepherd and you know what that name is given in the context of speaking about God as the shepherd of Israel let me read you the verses that surround the one that I just read beginning in verse 1 of Jeremiah 23 woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture saith the Lord Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them. And I will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. And they shall fear no more, nor be, dis nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. That's a messianic prophecy there in verse 5. I will raise unto David a righteous branch, one who would descend from David. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Now, here's the verse we just read. In his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called, this one who is the righteous branch, this one who is the king, this one who will save Judah and Israel. This is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. That's looking back to the crossing of the Red Sea, to the wilderness wanderings, to the institutions of the Feast of the Lord, to the institution of Passover, which foreshadows our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. No longer will they have to look backward, but they're going to look forward. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries whither he had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Dear people, we're beginning to see the beginnings of that as the Jews are being regathered from every corner of heaven. Over 100 nations from which they have returned from the third diaspora, the third dispersion and scattering of the Jews. And here it is prophesied by Jeremiah the prophet, hundreds of years before our Lord Jesus Christ. More than 2,500 years ago. And we're seeing it take place in our own lifetime. Yes, we see the context is the one who is the shepherd. He spent four verses talking about sheep and shepherds. How he is the shepherd who owns the flock and how there have been unfaithful shepherds who have not fed the flock. They've given them froth and nothing else. And that's where he promises the coming of the Messiah. The one who is called the branch of David the one who is called the king of Israel, the one who will save Judah and Israel. And when they dwell safely under his rule, he will go by the name, the Lord, our righteousness. So that's the second thing of importance. Not only is it seen in the context of the sheep and the shepherds, but the second thing of importance is the verse 7 and 8 that we just read, the prophetic future promises for the nation of Israel as a nation. Israel is not the church. The church is not Israel. The Old Testament is peppered with prophecies of the regathering of Israel as a nation in the last days. 
Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country. If you know the book of Ezekiel, chapters 38 through 40, that talks about the battle of Gog and Magog, and it describes the north country. It describes what we would today call Russia and the Balkan states and Turkey and other places that have held the Jews captive and who have produced horrendous holocausts and pogroms against the Jews through the centuries. And God has been bringing the Jews back now that Israel has started as a nation, 1948, May 1948. Israel became a state in a day, born in a day, just like the Bible prophesied would happen. And God is bringing them back from every country around the face of the globe. And there is coming a future day when the north countries are going to attack Israel. Oh, you read the prophecies of Scripture. Dear people, Scripture is true. And it is not an allegory. And it is fulfilled prophetically, literally. God keeps his word. Study the Bible. Forget all the other stuff. Study the Bible. Because God is fulfilling before our very eyes things that he promised centuries ago, millennia ago. What a marvelous truth it is. I will bring them out from all countries whither I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Israel out of their land for 2,000 years, and now we find Jews coming back to that land as a national entity for the first time since the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD. People, that should put the hair on the back of your neck standing upright. This is the God who says, this is my name, the Lord, my righteousness. This is the name by which I will be called when I reestablish my people. It proves that I am righteous. It proves that I'm not a liar. It proves that I'm a God who keeps his promises. It proves that I am righteous because I will judge the world as I have fulfilled my promises to Israel. That is an incredible promise. The name the Lord our righteousness deals with the future when Israel as a nation will come to Christ and receive the imputed righteousness which is by faith in him. It's not merely the Lord liveth in the past when Israel was formed as a nation, but it will be the Lord which liveth, the resurrected Christ, when he regathers them from that third diaspora, that third dispersion, and places them in the land of Israel. Now Paul speaks of that specifically. There is coming a day when the Jews as a nation will trust Christ. It seems impossible at times. I lived there for a year. I've witnessed to many of them. I've seen the blindness that Paul speaks of in the book of Romans. You share the gospel with them and they listen more politely than do American Jews. But in the end, they say, I don't understand that because how can God become a man? You see, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. That's what he claimed. That's what the New Testament clearly teaches. That was what was prophesied in the Old Testament. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Isaiah chapter 6, 9-6. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And the name, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. El Gibor, the Mighty God. That's the prophesied Messiah in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, 800 years before Jesus was born. The Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Micah 5, 2 tells us, Whose goings forth have been from old, even from everlasting. You know what the first part of that verse is? And thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be governor of my people, ruler of my people, whose goings have been from everlasting. That's the verse the scribes and the Pharisees quoted to King Herod. It was that Micah 5 2. That's the verse they quoted when he asked where the Messiah was supposed to be born. But they left out the last phrase, whose goings forth have been from old, even from everlasting. The only one of whom that phrase is used in the Old Testament is God himself. Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. Through the virgin birth, a literal virgin birth. 
And he bore our sins on Calvary's cross and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. If he remained dead, you and I are without hope. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians 15. If Jesus is still in the tomb, you have no hope. The resurrection is the proof that God has given to us that the death of Christ is available for those who trust in him for the forgiveness of all sin. 1 John, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Have you trusted him? Don't trust anything else. Don't trust Jesus plus something. That's like saying, I'm going to trust this water and one drop of arsenic to quench my thirst. Jesus alone, he is the living water. He is the bread come down from heaven. Trust him. Believe on him. Completely, not plus something else. Paul says, Romans 11:25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. Now, I didn't say blindness wholly, because there are some Jews who have trusted Christ. They have understood that he is their Messiah. Paul was one of them. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, and so all Israel shall be saved. There is coming a day when every Jew left alive on the face of earth is going to trust in Christ. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness for Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they, that is the Jews, are enemies for your sake. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. You see, God made a promise to Abraham. And God always keeps his promises. Even though many times in the Old Testament he calls them a stiff-necked, rebellious people. <laughs> he could say that of us too. We are a stiff-necked, rebellious people. And yet he still loves us. As touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Oh, what a marvelous, wonderful truth that is. These are great prophecies concerning the regathering of Israel, but we'll have to wait on that for another time. Our focus today is on the names of God, but clearly the name of God, the Lord who lives, is connected to the name, the Lord, our righteousness. And this is clearly connected by scripture that we have just brushed over to the death, burial, and resurrection and the future coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord, our righteousness, is clearly a name of God that refers to Jesus Christ according to the New Testament. Jesus Christ is the Lord, our righteousness. 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. 1 Corinthians 1, 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him, that is our Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hebrews 7.2 to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. He, you recall Hebrews chapter 7 is where it speaks of Melchizedek, the king of righteousness. Melchizedek, that Melchizedek, the word translated there, literally means king of righteousness. Where Melchizedek appears to Abraham and Abraham pays a tithe of everything he has to Melchizedek. And then we discover as we move through that passage that Melchizedek is a theophany, that is an appearance of God in the Old Testament without father, without mother, without beginning of days, without end of life. Melchizedek, now here's what the verse says. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. 
You remember the prophecy in Isaiah 9, 6 I just quoted a few moments ago? What is he? He's the Prince of Peace. He's the King of Righteousness. These are the titles that are applied to our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the Lord, our righteousness. We have no righteousness apart from Christ. Without Christ, there is no righteousness. Without Christ, there will no righteous judgment take place upon the earth. Without divine righteousness imputed to our account, transferred to our filthy, dirty account that is only a debit, and all of that erased, but without the righteousness of Christ given to us freely by God, we can't enter he into heaven. Righteousness is a gift. It's not earned by man. Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Romans 5, 17 through 21. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, that's speaking of Adam. That's how sin got into the world. That's why we're born sinners, is because there was a literal, historical Adam. It wasn't a matter of, you know, death and suffering for many, many millions of years, with dinosaurs and everything coming before man. God created everything in six days. Join us for our creation conference. We have scientists come here every year who understand the truth of Scripture and who demonstrate scientifically that the Bible is true. It's going to be on Saturday night, September 14th, and Sunday morning for Sunday school and morning worship. We invite you to attend. Rusty Folk will be the speaker. Uh, you see the signs up here at the big, uh, all the entrances to the uh, church that have information about that conference. But let me move on. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, that's why we're sinners, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Where do you get righteousness? Do you work for it? No, it's a gift. The gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, that is Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through the righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. We skip down five chapters to Romans 10. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. Do you fit verse 3 there, which is going about to establish your own righteousness? Are you one who, Paul says, is ignorant of God's righteousness? Are you one who has not submitted yourself unto the righteousness of God? Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Philippians chapter 3 verse 9, And be found in him, that is, in Christ, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Oh, people, you need nothing else. The righteousness which is of God by faith. That was the cry of the Reformation. Quote from Habakkuk chapter 2, repeated four times in the New Testament, the just shall live by faith. The just are those who have been declared righteous by God. That's what the doctrine of justification is about. Imputation is where we are made righteous. Justification is where we are declared righteous in the sight of a holy God. Because we are in Christ. We've placed our faith in Him. We're not sticking one arm out trying to hold on to our good works. That's not righteous. 
That's outside of Christ. And God sees it outside of Christ. We are in Christ, trusting him alone. The just shall live by faith. It changes your life too. Hebrews eleven seven By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Hebrews 11, 32 and 33. What shall I more say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. A man or a woman who wishes to become righteous can only become righteous in one way. We become righteous in the sight of God by faith in Christ. Romans, written by the Apostle Paul, chapter 10, verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Oh, how important it is that it's in your heart. Not merely something that is external. With the heart, man believeth, that's faith, unto righteousness. Galatians 6, 3, 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He didn't do anything. He believed. Now, once you have believed, it changes your life. But the point of entering into righteousness in the sight of God is by faith in Christ alone. That's what the scripture says over and over and over. Forget what false shepherds say. Forget what those who are teaching other ways of salvation say. Forget what those who are teaching false doctrines so they can put money in their own pockets say. What saith the scripture? It is by faith alone, in the Christ of Scripture alone. And God gives you the gift of eternal life. Dear friends, our time is up. I put a little clock here because I used to complain about not being able to see that one back there. And our time is up for today. But there is so much more. Divinely imputed righteousness by faith prophetic future in the righteousness of Christ, the practical application, how imputed righteousness should affect our lives here and now. How does God accomplish the transformed righteousness in our lives when we resist him? The fruit of righteousness. How do we know what God considers righteous and what he considers sin? <laughs> that has to wait for next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the righteousness which is by faith in Christ alone. What a magnificent name of God, a name which you are demonstrating yourself clearly by in these days when we see your promises to Israel, the flock that had been scattered, and the flock that you are now regathering in the land, and the name by which now you should be known, the Lord, our righteousness. A God who keeps his promises, a God who never lies, a God who is indeed righteous, who will vindicate his own and who will judge the world in righteousness. We thank you for that majestic and mighty name that you have given to yourself, the Lord our righteousness. For it is our Lord Jesus Christ who is our righteousness. He's made unto us the wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption of God himself. Father, I pray that if there is anyone here who is depending upon his or her own righteousness to somehow worm their way into heaven, that they will understand clearly that if they are not in Christ, fully in Christ, 
not trying to hold on to their good works as a means of salvation, not trying to hold on to their baptism as a means of salvation, not trying to hold on to their church membership as a means of salvation, not trying to hold on to their church attendance as a means of salvation, not trying to hold on to their giving to the church as means of salvation, or any other human work. For that's an insult to the finished work of Christ. They're telling you that they don't think Jesus did enough to save them. An infinite sacrifice by the infinite God of heaven who became man to die in our place because he loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth, that whosoever believeth, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In him, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord our righteousness. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, not our own righteousness, which is in your sight as you have declared yourself, but filthy rags. All that human, unclean, filthy rag righteousness. Thank you, Father, for your word. You have promised that your word will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. Take it and use it with power this day, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our